everyone. Welcome back to the Bay State Golf Podcast. This week's guest is golf course architect Mark Munjum. Over the last four decades, Munjum has made a huge impact on golf, especially in New England. He's had a hand in designing and building 33 courses, including Shaker Hills, Butterbrook, Blissful Meadows, Old Barnstable Fairgrounds, and obviously many, many more. If you've ever played Franklin Park or George Wright and have been impressed with the changes and improvements in the last decade or so, those are also Munjum projects as he has done restorations and renovations on top of building golf courses from scratch. During our discussion today, we cover how Munjum got into golf course architecture with the help of Jeffrey Cornish, his work at Olympia Fields in Chicago to prep for a U.S. Open, the differences between private and municipal projects. There are quite a few, as you would imagine. We also discuss rankings and Munjum's role on the American Society of Golf Course Architects. He will become the president starting in the fall of 2025. As always, thank you for your support. Please subscribe. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, know that you can also watch these podcasts on YouTube. I typically try to slide in some videos and images where I can that make sense. I also have a newsletter that you can subscribe to. It delivers every Friday morning. It kind of takes everything I've done, puts it in one place for people to find. I also collect some of my favorites from the week from articles to books I might have finished or might be reading uh, to music to podcasts, recipes that I tried out and liked, uh, drinks, all sorts of different stuff just to kind of wrap up the week. Uh, throw in some news and notes about just golf in the Bay State as well. So if, you, if you're if you looking for something that has a bunch of different things in it, uh, you can please subscribe to that. You can find it at baystategolf.beehive.com. And Beehive is B-E-E-H-I-I-V. Uh, would love new subscribers. It's always great to get new folks on board there. And uh, again, it gets everything that I do from the week and thoughts from the week all in one place with additional news and notes about stuff going on in Bay State Golf, which is kind of a busy place right now as we head into the summer. All right, let's get to my discussion with Mark Munjum. All right, I want to welcome in Mark Munjum to the Bay State Golf Podcast. Mark, thanks for joining me uh, on a Monday after the U.S. Open. You're welcome, Sean. Thanks for having me. Yeah, looking forward to uh, chatting about golf, golf course architecture, what you're up to, what you've been up to, uh, your experience in the field. Uh, if you have played golf in Massachusetts, the likelihood of playing a golf that uh, golf course that Mark designed uh, is is pretty high. So uh, we'll we'll get to a bunch of those. But I thought just because a lot of people watched Pinehurst this past weekend, watched the U.S. Open, you wrote me a little note before we started that you actually worked in Pinehurst, one of your earlier projects. So I thought maybe I would just kind of love to quickly or for a while hear about what that was like. Uh, does watching a U.S. Open at Pinehurst kind of bring about different memories or different thoughts about your time down there when you worked on number six, I think is what you uh, what you wrote in your notes. Yeah, I did. I had the uh, fortune of... Um working on Pinehurst number six on the construction team. Um, wasn't there when the work started, but uh, I, I got sent down there and spent like three months in, in Pinehurst uh, and had a great time. You know, I, I was not real familiar with Pinehurst before I went down there. And so I really was able to take it all in and play Pinehurst number two several times and see a lot of the other golf courses in the area. Um, it was a great, great experience. Does that, did that, I mean, you were just relatively new out of college, right? If it was, I think you said it was your fourth project. So you're, you're kind of just out of right. WPI. We're both, we both went to school in Worcester too, as I went to Holy Cross. Um, okay. Yeah. Does that experience, how, how does that Im affect the rest of your, your work? Um, did it, you said you didn't know much about Pinehurst, you, you know, playing number two, Donald Ross growing up here, Donald Ross is, you know, you grew up here too, is, uh, is a popular figure. And another guy, if you've played golf in Massachusetts, you've likely played a Ross course. 
Um, mm -hmm. Did that just impact your design and what you looked for in golf courses and what you liked to build? It really did. Um, you know, I was working on a Reese Jones design. Pine, uh, that was what Pinehurst number six was and was working with Reese on that. And um, but the ability to go see the other courses at Pinehurst, um, especially Pinehurst number two, I, I really took that course in. What I really learned from Pinehurst number two was it didn't have to be really fancy to to be a great golf course. And that the the greens and the green surrounds what really make the course special and what really bring it difficulty. So, I, I mean, what I learned from that was to really use a lot of chipping areas, use, uh, you know, short grass as a method to impact the game and impact how, how people play the golf course. Um, I, I learned that, you know, chipping areas were, um, were you know, difficult for good players, but for the average player, yeah, they just putt out of them, putt onto the green, you know, hit it. Maybe they hit another putt and they make a par, you know, and it, it just, it really even things out. So, um, you know, in golf course architecture, uh, to make it a challenge for better players, uh, we like to invoke indecision. And that's exactly what chipping areas do is they make you have to decide, do I hit a wedge? Do I hit a putt? You know, do I hit my three wood? So indecision mm -hmm. is, is great. It taps into, because I, I feel the same way just when I'm playing, it taps into that, like the pride of I'm a, I'm a two or three handicap kind of always hovering around there and putting you feel like you're, you're give you you're potentially giving up a shot, but chipping can be scary as hell on those types of, and so you, it's the indecision and the pride of like, I should be good enough to chip from these spots and watching yesterday and watching Rory and Bryson and the rest of the field. I mean, I would get, I get anxious just watching, you know, Rory hit that chip on 18 from just in front of the green and you know, he's going to hit it fine, but like it, it is a, it is a fascinating uh, part of the game. Z even Xander getting up and down at a uh, Valhalla on, uh, you know, he had to right. kind of hit like a tough little chip shot, uh, which is way different than hitting it with a bunch of rough underneath it or kind of gouge it out. So yeah, it definitely is a, a thing that I appreciate. It, it drives me nuts as a, someone who has difficulty chipping off tight lies. Yeah. And, and unless you've been to Pinehurst and seen the greens, you really can't understand how challenging they are and how good those players are to be able to, you know, make pars and, you know, infrequently make birdies, but to hit into those greens, they, they are, the real usable area on them is so, so small. And uh, obviously for the US Open, they're, they're hard and fast and I, I just can't imagine trying to hit a ball into those greens. Yeah, I played there two years ago, and uh, I definitely putted in a lot of places on two and on number four. It was another one that just made me feel like I'm just gonna, I can just putt <laughs> everywhere, and I'll be, I'll yeah, be just fine. Yeah, they can, they can make you feel really silly. I mean, you yeah. can go ping pong and back and forth, and just say, oh, I give up. <laughs> yep. And the other interesting part of your kind of connection to the U.S. Open this year was. Uh, you did some Bryson. work at Olymp Bryson and Olympia Fields, uh, where he won his USAM is a is a place that you did a, a, a bunch of work to get it ready for the, I don't know what year that US Open was when Furyk won. It's a long time ago 2003. now. Two thousand three. Two thousand three. So that was, that was another connection you had. So that you, can you talk a little bit about working at Olympia Fields? And then I think the next step is logically talking about from there you know, you work on municipal golf courses and you work kind of the other side of, of the, the golfing world as well. Not just, not just major championship venues that are steeped yeah. in history, but the, uh, those not. important munis that kind of are the lifeblood of the game. I think they are, you're right. Yeah. I had the great fortune of, um, being the consulting architect at Olympia fields country club in Chicago for 25 years. And so, uh, started with a master plan in the early 90s. Uh, they, they took on the senior open and that went well, well enough that, you know, the players said this could be a, you know, is the caliber of a U.S. open course with some with some changes. And so the USJ came back and offered them the U.S. open. Um, and but, you know, to get the U.S. open, they had to make some some changes to the golf course. So I was put in charge of, uh, you know, designing those changes. So in 1999, I uh, went through a renovation process to 
lengthen the course, you know, revise the bunkering, deepen the bunkering, um, and, and make it more of a challenge to, to the players. So they hosted the O3 uh, U.S. Open. Um, and since then, they've, you know, ho hosted the Women's KPMG Ch PGA Championship and uh, the 2015 U.S. Amateur. So the amateur was won by Bryson to Shambo. So, yeah, there's that tie-in of Pinehurst and, uh, and Bryson. Yeah. Olympia Fields also hosted last year, I believe it was one of the FedEx Cup events that Hovland, I think Hovland won Correct. and shot right. some bonkers number on the back 28 or something to, to win when he was uh, kind of at the peak of his young powers. Maybe he gets it back, but that was if, that's maybe the most recent place if people are trying to conjure up when, when they've seen it most recently. That's, uh, that's when it was there. What right. I'm always... You have this funny, you, you, the balance of, as an architect and taking an old golf course, you said lengthening it, deepening bunkers, trying to get ready for uh, the best players in the world. Uh, but then also just honoring like the initial design and the, how, how do you balance those two things? I've asked other people this too. It's always interesting to hear you because you kind of, you are at your heart and an, an artist and you're designing things, but then you're taking someone else's design and trying to make it uh, a modern challenge for new equipment. And that's even different now than it was in, in 1999, I'm sure. But how do you balance those two things? Well, I try to be respectful of the original design and the original designer's work. Um, but I also try to accommodate you know, the modern player and the mod modern maintenance, modern conditioning and all that. So um, you have to kind of try to pull the two together. Um, I worry less about um, lengthening the course, making it more challenging than I do making just making it better, making it so that uh, the circulation is good, that it plays well, that um, it's fun to play basically. So, I mean, I feel like those are my priorities over uh, making a more challenging golf course or restoring it exactly to what it was. I think that that has become, you know, that's, that's good for some courses, obviously some of the classics out there that are, are worth restoring, but many golf courses are not I don't want to say worth restoring, but, you know, restoring shouldn't be the priority. The sh priority should be to, to, you know, sympathetically renovate it is what we call it. And yeah. um, to, uh, but make it better, make a better golf course for, for the modern player. Yeah. You, you said, use the word circulation. What does that mean? That's a word I don't hear a lot. Is that routing wise or is that kind of. Yes, it's accommodating um, today's use of the golf course. In other words, um, you know, golf, golf carts were, were mm. never a part of the old golf courses. And so carts have been added, cart paths have been added. And um, sometimes they get put in in the wrong places or they're too visual or whatever. So, you know, we're, we're looking to, to move them or, or it might be that uh, the, the movement from, uh, from the, from the green to the tee or from the path to the green, we can maybe shift a bunker so that we're opening up the space. So there's a wider walk area and you don't have these cart trails and things like that. So that's what I mean by circulation. It's just how the player moves through the golf course and to, uh, you know, not have that movement either slow down play or create maintenance issues for the golf course superintendent. Yeah. You, so you grew up, in Berlin, Mass, kind of close to where I grew up in in Acton. I've never played Berlin Country Club, but that's where you kind of got your start at in in golf. Uh, Absolutely. Can you bring us back to that, and then we'll work our way to your your work in uh, in, in golf? Yeah, sure. I mean, I I I didn't grow up in a family that played golf. I. My uncle had cut down a five iron and given it to my brother at some point. And I grabbed the club and started to, you know, hit balls, not balls, hit like little wiffle golf balls in the backyard. And um, then went to the golf course and at Berlin Country Club and, you know, played a couple times, spent more time looking for balls than I did hitting balls. You know, <laughs> it was like that was more fun than it was to play. Um, but I, when I was uh, 
15, they had an old home day in town and they set up a hole in one contest and I won closest to the hole. And uh, the, the prize was a membership to the club for a year. Amazing. And so that's what really got when I was 15. I started playing more golf and really started to enjoy it a lot more. And um, that's that's how I kind of got started. And then when I was in college, I uh, started working at that golf course doing the maintenance. So it was me and one other one other guy the same age. And uh, he used to mow the fairways and I used to mow the greens and the uh, and the aprons. <laughs> that was yeah, that was our job. So did that for four years. Did you in at WPI was was golf course architecture and was this your kind of end game? Were you? I, I see. I know here you were a civil and environmental engineer, but you you're shaking your head like now. That's this yeah, is a. Uh, I stumbled into this. Not at all. It wasn't <laughs> at all. It wasn't a thought in my head when I was in the major. Um, it came about because I was. I was, I guess you'd call him an, an, me an environmentalist. I was actually a member of the conservation commission in the town of Berlin, even though I was only 18 at the wow. time. And, uh, um, I was really interested in hiking and walks and I did a lot of mapping and stuff like that. And so the owner of Berlin country club, who was a friend, uh, he wanted to lengthen the course. It was, it's par 33, um, you know, 20, 400 yards. I can't remember how long it is, but it's not a long golf course. And he's like, you know, we really should lengthen this hole and I could maybe put the green over here. And, and I, so I got involved with him and started looking at the golf course and I brought out my maps and uh, my USGS maps. And I started to plot, you know, some things on there. And I went to the library and I took out a book uh, by Jeffrey Cornish called the golf course. And I read that book cover to cover. And I'm like, damn, this is what I would really like to do. This, I don't want to design wastewater treatment plants the rest of my life. I think golf course design would be a lot more fun. So I wrote Mr. Cornish and he said, well, you know, with your uh, civil engineering background, um, I would suggest you notify some contractors that you'd like to go to work in golf. So I didn't know there was such a thing as a golf course contractor that there was, you know, that contractors specialize in that. So I wrote several people and I got a, I got a job in golf course construction. And that's basically how I got started was, you know, the connection of Burl and country club and them maybe doing some work and, you know, making some changes and, and learning about golf architecture by reading about it. Cause I, after reading the golf course, I read other golf course design books and, and that that's how I picked it up. Yeah. Amazing. A book and a letter to the author, and here you yeah, are. Yeah, and Jeffrey That's Cornish, amazing. you know, he's uh, he did a lot of work here in New England. Uh, you, I'm sure you know his name and and know yep. his history here. Um, and he was he was quite the, quite a gentleman, um, and uh, would help anybody who asked. So yeah, thank thank goodness for him. And now fast forward to today and, and you're you're a busy you're a busy man doing a bunch of work all over the state all over the northeast what what is what is like a quote unquote normal day for Mark Munjum It depends a little bit on the season yep. um obviously I am most busy in the spring and the fall um but you know in the spring and the fall I'm, I'm on the road usually four to five days a week. I'm usually, and when I say I'm on the road, you know, uh, a day might be, I go to uh, Franklin Park in the morning and then Hillview in North Reading in the afternoon. And then I'm in back in the evening. I might, you know, work for a little bit in the evening on the computer, writing a report or, or doing something. And then the next day it's might be New Jersey uh, it might be Pennsylvania. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of, um, I mostly work in the Northeast right now, so I'm not, I'm not getting on planes at the moment. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's going out and visiting courses, seeing the work that you're doing or visiting with clubs about, uh, doing potential work. Yeah. What, uh, how do you kill time on the road when you're driving? You a music I listen guy? To books. You listen to books. I listen to books. Yep. Most, mostly. Yeah. I listen, golf, uh, stuff know. about golf or you kind of separate yourself from 
golf stuff yeah, and no, just try I to... separate myself from golf. <laughs> yeah. It's usually stuff that uh, keeps me awake. <laughs> so it's like uh, suspense type books <laughs> yeah. is what I mostly listen to. That's awesome. I was at Franklin Park a week ago to a week and a half ago. I got to play there. I got to play there twice. Place looks awesome. I know you've Thanks. been doing some work um, out there. And Russell and... Heller does a great job uh, on, the, on the golf course superintendent. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's been a, a match made in heaven there. And you've also done work at George Wright. So thinking about Olympia fields and that side of the world, and then de- working in, in city limits with two municipal golf courses, what, what are those experiences like? What are the challenges? Um, I think they've both come a long way in the, I know I know 18, they hosted the Mass Am, they, they were co-hosts, and that was a, a big deal for those two courses and kind of getting them in a place to be ready to host that event has definitely had a good tail on this end of things where people are still enjoying the courses and they have not been uh, kind of lost or whatever word you want to use. So they're, they're still outstanding. What was, what was it like just, and what has it been like working in those fields? Well, first off, I'm glad you say that. I'm glad you say that about those two courses and that, you know, the Mass Am has been a benefit and has continued to draw players to them because I'm seeing the same thing when I go out there. And uh, that makes me pretty proud, very happy. Um, they're, they're, you know, two very different golf courses, but but, <laughs> but really good golf courses. So, um, and the city has been great about spending some money to, you know, to make improvements there. So, um, in terms of my work and how I work there, it's a very different working um, working conditions than it would be working at a private club. I will say that um, any of the public work that I do, the municipal work that I do, um, it requires a little bit more effort. I would say on my part, you have to be more precise about what your plans are going to be and how much you think it's going to cost. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty limited generally in that regard. You go into something with a known budget, it's, and it can't cost a dollar more, you know, if you bid it and it's $5 more than what's budgeted, it, you, you have to do, go over, you have to change the plans and do it again. It's not <laughs> yeah. like you, can, you can't reward it if it's, if it's more money than what's, what's available. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I've found to be really rewarding, quite honestly, to work in the public venue, uh, um, not just at George Wright and, and William Devine, but in all my work, I, I would say that, you know, I've kind of graduated a little bit from chasing the private club jobs and which are every golf course architect wants and, um, and doing re redoing things that might have just been done previously you know that's and that's what's happening at a lot of these private clubs they're they're just they're changing things constantly right and i got tired of that a little bit quite honestly um so you know i found that my forte is more that more doing work at these municipalities doing work on public venues I still love to work at private clubs i still have a lot of private club you know uh, clients, but I do enjoy working at the, at the public courses. I, I tend to find that guys like you and, and those people that play the public courses are more appreciative basically of what's getting done and the improvements that they see. And so that makes me feel good. I like that. Yeah. George Wright and Franklin Park are definitely two very, very different places when you, so when did you start working at those two, just to stick to those two? Has that been uh, a 10 year thing? Do you, you be the timeline versus me guessing? <laughs> well, um, both courses were, were being main, maintained by a management company. And then right. the city decided they wanted to take them over and didn't do the maintenance and, and run, the, run, the, run the courses themselves. And it was right about that time that I was hired to do a master plan for George Wright. And I think that was like 2005 or something like that. Okay. And so then 2009 was our first project at George Wright, which was uh, the 13th hole there. 
Um, and now uh, we've been doing work at both courses a year since then, you know, yeah. we, we started out doing work at both courses in the same year. And it was like two years of doing that. And we says, why are we doing this? It's trying, you know, it's really hard to go back and forth from one site to the other and work on both. So it's like, well, let's just work at one course one year and we'll skip the other course. And so we've been working every other year at each golf course, um, up until this year. So, well, could you describe George Wright in 2005? What was, what did it like? What did it look like? What were some of the things that right away you're like, oh, this, this is, you know, that it's been either just neglected or forgotten about, or they've just let this, this thing slide. Yeah. And that's what you just said is absolutely the case is that there had either, they had either let things slide, let things grow in from the outside edges and everything had grown in. So everything had gotten narrower. Irrigation system was in, you know, poor condition, even though it was a fairly new system, there was a lot of problems with the irrigation system. The installer, you know, wasn't a good installation. And, um, yeah, it was, it was worn out basically, yeah. you know, uh, they hadn't put any money into it. So it was all this deferred maintenance. So Len Curtin superintendent there, you know, was brought on and, um, he, he's been great. I mean, he's been really, he's, he came from the, he had worked at the country club. He, he enjoyed the history of George Wright. He knew the history of it and uh, he wanted the, and Donald Ross, obviously. And his goal was to, you know, bring it back, restore it. Um, not in the sense of like a restoration, like following a plan and making it exactly like what the Donald Ross plan was, but more restore the conditioning, restore the playability. Um, and, and so then I got involved in that obviously. And, um, you know, we've been trying to, we've been working on drainage and making tees bigger, as you know, and, uh, you know, removing features that had been added, you know, uh, last job we did was we took out bunkers on the left side of hole 10 because they were never part of the original plan. And so we removed them and, uh, made it, you know, brought it back and put it into rough. So, um, that's, that's what George Wright has been it. And it's a, it is a labor of love. Let me tell you, because <laughs> it is a great golf course. I, I, and thoroughly enjoy going there every, you know, and working there. And, um, I hope, I hope people see it as improvement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, everyone I talk to, they, they are always so impressed with it. I mean, I'd imagine you said it was a labor of love. Just it's gotta be like the challenging teenager, right? It's just, it has so many little quirks and <laughs> a little bit of a temper with just how, uh, the rocks and the, just the, the land that it's on has got to make it so challenging to, um, just to do work there and figure out what I'm sure you run into issues and problems with whatever can get in the way, a uh, little temperamental teenager type. <laughs> it is that for sure. Yes. I mean, and it's not, uh, it's hard. It's hard because it, there's, it's rocky and it's hard because where it's not rock, it's wet. So, you know, it's mm. either one extreme or the other and, uh, trying to fix that while, you know, well, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy, but it's, it's a joy to try to do so. So, um, yeah, hoping again, hoping it's better. I get, the only thing I get frustrated at is when I, I might read, something that pops up on golf club atlas or or something that says you know it's one of those places that it's in need of a restoration and i go what <laughs> what do you mean we're we're in the middle of a restoration it's, <laughs> we're not a private club that can spend you know eight million dollars and do it all at one time but i mean it's definitely been restored to some extent you know it's not complete i understand that but yeah that's uh, yeah that's the one thing that i when i sometimes read that that it's like good grief what do I need that's to do? An yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I just to pick, not pick on, but pick out Worcester Country Club, who in the last year has done this major Beautiful. restoration. Yeah. It looks awesome. I have not, I have not seen it with my own eyes, just pictures and stuff. But talking yeah. to the people I know who are members there, like they lost three holes at a time. George Wright, George Wright cannot afford to no. work their way around a golf course and have fifteen holes open and and still charge full price or charge a lower price and hope people are happy. They would just lose. I think they would lose a lot of people to other golf right. courses around. Cause that's how public golf works too. People will just go find 18 holes to play or 
a nine hole course yeah. that they like. So that's the challenge. Yeah. I mean, what Worcester did was great. I mean, uh, I, yeah, it's I, amazing, I've but they can the afford chance. to do it. And they can afford to do it, right? And um, and they they have the ability to you know close the course, and the members get can go play other courses that they have reciprocals with, right? And so, but George Wright can't do that, and and so you end up with situations like you did the other day at um, at Franklin Park, where you know you had to walk around the fourth tee to go play from the rough <laughs> in front of the tee. Um, yeah. But the course is still open, and you're still playing eighteen holes. Yep. Yep. So the other, the other kind of part of your, just, you've been doing this for a long time. So that gets you some, I don't know, honors and, and opportunities to be a leader in the field. You're a treasurer right now for the American Society of Golf Course Architects. You're on the cusp of becoming the president of that in the fall of 25. So you're, you've got a, a year to get your, uh, yourself together there for that job. Yeah, get my act together, <laughs> don't I? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a, a role that I, the first meeting was at Pinehurst and Donald Ross was the first president. Um, yes. so a little full circle there for you as well. Can you just, could you tell people a little bit about the society and, and what your role as president would be or, or, or is? Um, yeah, the American Society Golf Course Architect was formed, as you said, in 1946. Um, it's just a group of, um, you know, North 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 American golf course architects that, that practice golf course architecture and um, have to have done a certain amount of work before they can qualify to becoming a member. So you have to, it used to be you had to do five new courses when I was getting in these days to the qualifications have um, changed because there were so few new golf courses being built that, you know, um, we, one was qualifying to become a member anymore. So we had, you know, had to obviously adjust to, uh, to allow um, people doing renovation work to become members. Um, you know, there's not many, I think there's 125 or so golf course architects in the ASGCA. Not everybody that does golf course design is in it, you know, there are some mm. that haven't joined, but, um, you know, we like to think that we're the, you know, the leaders in our field. Um, obviously we, we are, you know, we're one of the allied associations. Um, you know, we're always getting together with the USGA and the golf course builders and the golf course superintendents and PGA of America, whenever any, you know, whenever there's a, you know, there's a function we're we're all there together, working together to hopefully better the game of golf. And um, so I've been active in it since 1994. And uh, sorry about that. There's an, there's an emergency at Franklin Park. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Why are they calling me then? <laughs> so, yeah, since 1994, I've been in it. Uh, you know, I've been on different committees, the environmental committee and membership committee. And uh, a few years ago, um, I expressed that. Uh, I wouldn't mind being on the executive committee. And so I got nominated to be on the executive committee. And that's a like a, a five-year thing where you, you know, you start out as secretary, move to treasurer, move to VP, and then on up to president and then as past president. So yeah, I'm, I'm on the way to becoming president of the society. So over those 30 years. It's pretty cool. I mean, I, yeah. Jeff Cornish was president of the society. I, I, I wanted to kind of follow in his footsteps. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm going to do. Over the course of those 30 years, I'm sure those meetings have, uh, struck different tones and hit on different topics or, you know, things that you're all keeping at the forefront of your mind. What, what has maybe what has changed the most or what does, what are you maybe as a group or what conversations do you have that, that uh, kind of make you think about the next 10 years of, of golf course architecture. Yeah, that is definitely always a topic of conversation as to what direction do you think golf is going and um, you know, what do you think we'll be doing? And it's not always easy to, uh, to guess as to, as to, as to that. Um, Cause golf has been so cyclical, you know, um, Four years ago, before the ten pandemic, I mean, we were all worried about our jobs. Uh, there wasn't yeah. any, there wasn't much going on in golf, and you know, there are fewer players every year. It seemed like, and so, 
the pandemic has been great for golf course design, great for golf courses. So we're very lucky in that regard. Um, but our meetings, you know, that's the most fun about being part of the ASGCA is, is our, we have an annual meeting every year. It's not in the same place. It moves all around. Um, it's, it's based, the location is selected based upon the golf courses that are there, quite honestly. And we like to go to places that have good golf courses. So <laughs> I've, you know, I've had the, our, our meetings have been on Long Island and we've played Shinnecock and, you know, and, uh, uh, the, all the, the Maidstone and the courses out at the end of Long Island. Um, uh, we've met in Philadelphia and played Aronimink and Marion and we've met, uh, you know, all the, all the, all the great, great golf yeah. courses. So that's, that's certainly, certainly we've met at Pinehurst a couple of times. That's, that's a lot of fun getting together with other golf architects and talking about how they do business and, and where they're at. And, uh, that's, it's a great learning experience. I mean, I've learned a ton from, from being at the meetings and talking to other people about how they, how they work. And then in the, I think in the past few years, um, we've noticed that there's been a greater emphasis on collaboration, whereas it used to be very competitive between architects and it still is uh, obviously between some architects it's still very competitive, but there's also been a greater sense of, um, getting together and, and combining your forces to, uh, to get a job, maybe in an area that you don't normally work. So you got guys from Chicago and Mississippi, maybe getting together and, and collaborating on a job in, you know, St. Louis or something like that. Mm. So, I mean, that, that's been, that comes about from getting to know uh, the other people that are in, in the group and, um, you know, becoming friends with them or, or at least get respecting what they do and trying to use them to help you. So that's, that's been a great part of being in the ASGCA. Are there any, you know, I think everyone knows the, the big names, the, the Hanses and the Dokes and the core Crenshaws. And, um, are there any younger architects who kind of impress you or inspire you, uh, or you feel like you got to, or this, this new crew coming up is, is pretty good. Are there any names, uh, that stand out to you from, from who you've met and see, or even just work guy, you've seen from guys or girls? Yeah, I, there's man. Yeah. There's some, there are some really talented people, um, in the business, um, and just, just coming up into the business now. I, I would say that the talent is greater now than it, than it was when I was getting into the business. I think when I got into the business, it was, um, you know, you joined a, a big firm as an apprentice and you sat at a drafting table and you drew the plans up that they wanted to have done. And you, you know, you got into the work kind of slowly in that regard. And today, boy, you've got uh, younger people that are, you know, they, they get their start out on jobs, shaping jobs and working in construction and really learning on the ground. And I think that's, um, that's how I kind of learned too. But I mean, it was, uh, because I did do the four years of construction, but still, um, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of new people in the bit, in the work that are, that are studying more. Um, they're learning more from the computer. They have access to a lot more information and, uh, Therefore, they're they're taking the uh, golf architecture to some some greater heights. Uh, there's a I think his name's Brian Schneider. Um, mm -hmm. Is that right? Do I have yeah, it right? Yeah, he did old he did old Barnwell. He did I old think. Barnwell, yeah, which a Chicago I think, guy. I mean, the pictures that I've seen, obviously, I have never <laughs> seen it, but I mean, it it looks it looks like some a course that I would love because it's got the quirky features. Um, old style look to it. Um, I, it just looks awesome. Yeah. Wild greens he's, looks like he would be one on, greens. you know, he'd definitely be one on that list that I think yeah. is, uh, an up and comer for sure. Yeah. Um, there's others names are escaping me right now, but yeah, there's, there I are put you on the spot. Others. Angela yeah, Moser. She's, mm. uh, she's somebody that she, she's, uh, uh, worked at Pinehurst number 10, the new course there. And, yep. uh, Looks like that's uh, pretty special. Um, yeah, that, that there's others that are out there that are doing great work. Yeah, Tom Doak put her in charge, and it sounds like she did an awesome job 
um, yeah. out at number 10. It's pretty cool. You, I, I'm glad you mentioned just that Barnwell, Old Barnwell is a place that you think you would like, because I did want to just ask, you're a New Englander. I, I feel like there's this interesting dynamic between people up in this area that like love the tree line deep in the woods uh, kind of golf courses. And then there's the folks who, you know, love the places. And I think George Wright and Franklin Park, to go back to them again, are kind of like an, in, they're like a good test case because you get to Franklin Park and you can see everything and you're at George Wright and you can, you feel like you're very much on one hole at a time unless you really look around. So wh what for you kind of is, do you like both? Is there something that stands out about one or the other that just standing in a spot you feel uh, you like to look out at more? Which, which for you is better? And maybe there's not an answer, but I think it's a funny dynamic up here. Yeah, I mean, I love both. I definitely, um, I, I like both styles of courses. Um, I, I just like that go when golf courses fit the site mm. and are are designed appropriately to to what the land provides so if you're working in a forest then i think it should stay a woodland you know bordered golf course if you're working in an open on an open site then obviously the open golf course is better and don't plant a whole bunch of trees between the holes so that would be my, my number one i think that um man we have turned the corner on on trees on golf courses and uh you know 10 years ago it was a took an act of congress to cut down trees on most of the private clubs that i worked at and nowadays you've got you know a certain percentage of the membership saying take them all down we don't want any trees out here so get, let's get rid of all of them and you're seeing a a real a real you know it's i think it's a bit of a fad to to take down trees and that I think is, I don't think that's always correct. I, I mean, I, I tend to like trees that are more, I would say parkland style, where you have holes that are within the trees and then you might come out of the trees and there's no trees. And then you kind of maybe go back into the trees for a couple holes and then come back out and there's, or there's windows where you can see and you have, dis, you know, you can see a distance through it. Those are, I think, my preferred courses is, is the ones that, that have a balance and that mix those two features uh, together. Yeah. One place that stands out to me that you worked on was, is Butterbrook just has that, it that does. energy to it where you, everyone, I, I had an event there a couple of weeks ago and people who had never played were, I think, blown away by you finish 11 and you kind of take this long walk through the woods and then you're in this open right space and that feels normal. It doesn't feel it's, it's jarring. in just the fact that you've played a bunch of holes through the trees and you get out there and you're like, Oh, I can breathe. And I can hit the ball a little wild. And this is, this is great. And then you kind of travel back in after, uh, you know, 16 kind of brings you back into the, the tree lined area a little bit. Um, so I, yeah, that's, as you were talking, that course just came to mind. Akushnet River I, Valley is another one that has that same kind of feel to it. No, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I, when I, when I was talking about it, I was thinking a little bit about Barterbrook myself. So I, <laughs> I I agree. I mean, I have in the past. I got to say, I was I'm I'm a bit of a tree hugger, and uh, some of the courses <laughs> that I've done are too narrow. And I wish I could go back there and say, guys, come on, let's get the chainsaws out. I think we need to. I need think we need to widen this corridor some. Um, you know, Cyprian Keys falls into that into that mm -hmm. boat uh, just is uh, is too too narrow. I mean, there's reasons why uh, every every more you know every more ten feet of width that we were were trying to get there. I mean, it meant bringing in more soil, covering the rock, and there was a great expense to do so. So there was there's reasons why it's as narrow as it is. But um, yeah, I wish I wish there's a few courses out there of mine that uh, I wish were a little bit wider than what they are. Yeah, I have a uh, a Publix qualifier at Cyprian Keys next month. I have not played there in a very long time, probably since I was in like middle school, maybe high school, and it it still is like one of those places that's seared in my mind just because of how targety it was and yeah, um it as is. a 
14 year old with a big looping fade it was uh it was a disastrous place to play golf so i'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to going back and and playing it again with a little bit of a straighter golf ball um that's yeah bring your you long irons and make sure you've practiced those long irons a little bit because uh, there's sure. not, you don't have to hit many drivers out there and and shouldn't so yep yep <laughs> um the maybe the the last thing i thought we could hit on um and maybe it'll bring us to something else, but I, I, I posted a couple of weeks ago about rankings and, uh, the golf weeks, publicly accessible rankings. And you actually emailed in an email to me kind of said, this is, it, it just, I don't know if it struck a nerve or it's just something that you think about a lot, but, uh, how do rankings not impact you necessarily, but just the maybe the industry if that's the right word or just the way things kind of fall as far as jobs and maybe decisions that you see you making or other architects making or how how does it have an impact is that what you want to talk about but i i i post something about Cape Cod national being the you know the top publicly accessible right. golf course which is yep. um which is for people who are listening and maybe didn't see it and i i just kind of took took a moment to react to it on on instagram but uh, how does it affect you or, or does it not affect you? And you, you could not care less about rankings. I, Oh, I certainly care about rankings. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, how can you not, um, every architect wants their courses to be ranked and to be ranked highly. But that said, you can't design only thinking about rankings because they're not going to happen. I mean, there's mm. so few courses that get ranked, even though there's all these different rankings now. I mean, everybody's <laughs> right. doing ranking, right? And there's public course and classic course and modern course and all that. But still, um, it's, a, it's a challenge to um, get, your, get your courses on those lists. Um, it, it takes more than just doing a good job is what I've, I think I've learned. It, ta it, it takes someone else pushing you know, the marketing and getting it out front or getting people to come to the golf course. Um, it, it's, um, it's more than just what I can do personally. Yeah. So I've, you know, as I've aged, I've, um, just kind of said, I'm not going to worry so much about rankings and I'm just going to do the best job that I can do. And, um, if it doesn't end up getting ranked and it doesn't end up getting ranked and, you know, I'm just going to try to do, do, what I feel is the best for my, for my client, you know, to produce what they're looking for. So, yeah, I, I mean, obviously I, you're always peeking at the rankings. It's like, okay. That's, I appreciate the honesty. I think some people would say like, I don't ever think about them or they don't matter to me or whether that's the truth or not, but I, I appreciate the honesty of like, yeah, it matters. It, it's something that I, you take a little bit of pride in to be on a list with other golf courses or to be at the top or near the top of a list. So I appreciate yeah, I mean, you. I mean, I would always, when Golf Digest put out their rankings every year, I would always look to see, well, where's Olympia Fields at now? You know, mm. and after the renovation work that we did, it climbed the rankings, you know, it got, I don't know what it got to, but it was in the top 50 at some point. And now since that point, you know, there's been a lot of other restoration work done and a lot of other golf courses that have had tournaments. And so it's fallen back and you know, it's the same course, it's the same design, but yet it, it falls away. So, um, you know, obviously I would, I, I would love it not to, but that's, but that's what happens. Um, and then you also see that, that new course, it gets a lot of attention and boom, it mm. ends up right on the rankings really high. And that's the kind of stuff that kind of disappoints me is but I, I think that courses need a little bit more time and a little bit more evaluation to, to, to know whether they're one of the top courses or not. So, yeah. Um, so I'm hoping, but I am hoping that, you know, because of the work that we just did at, or I just did at farm neck, that that's going to soar up the rankings in the Massachusetts public and maybe knock off, uh, uh um, Cape Cod national. Yeah. Bring it down a yeah. notch. Yeah. So you, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be looking, you can, you can be sure I'm going to be looking. <laughs> There's also so, so Sean, uh, you got to come up with your rankings. I know I'm so I'm terrified to do rankings for that reason. I'm too <laughs> I'm too uh, thin skinned a lot of the time to uh, to put and 
I don't play places. I think I try to, if I do rankings, I'll do something that I, you know, here's what I played this year. Cause it is hard to, for me, a place I might've played three years ago, as I've kind of collecting all these golf courses that always feels not necessarily unfair, but that's, I don't remember it great. I could have played it in, right. in October uh, and you don't get to see it kind of in its truest form. And I'm only one person, uh, whereas, you know, those magazines get to send people out. So I, I, I do, I created little tiers because I think tiers for me feel like even when I'm looking at rankings, I kind of look at them in chunks more than I do like one, two, three, four, five. Uh, there's always kind of these, for me, bright lines of like, oh, these, the top four are kind of clearly better in whatever list or the top six. And then there's a little bit of a drop to seven, eight, nine, ten. You can kind of start, you, I, I kind of feel like tiers is how my brain works a little bit. It's safer. I'm like, I'm like the half score guy. If you're if you want one out of 10, I'm going to give you a five and a half or a seven and a half. I, I have a hard time committing to whole numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's all right. I understand completely. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, that's how I tend to look at things. I tend to group them and these are the top courses and you know, this is the next level down, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not Tom Doak. I don't have a confidential guide and have a rating system. <laughs> I'll, you know, uh, yeah. But yeah, I have places that I've played that I, I tend to prefer over others that I feel like, yeah, they, those, these are the, these are the best courses I've played. Yeah. So. Do I finish and want to go right to the first tee box again and, and give it another whirl is one of my big things too. I think for the rankings, there's also, I've noticed just some of the Massachusetts courses, not to like name specific ones, but even in the, like the nation's top hundred that, that, uh, you know, Massachusetts courses have made it. There's like a little bit of just the taste of, you know, you said removing trees or kind of these little fads that pop into golf course architecture. I think those can also just impact the rankings on a year to year basis, or, you know, a little three year chunk of time where you see a one course jump another one just for what people particularly are talking about or what's the kind of the golf uh, the golf scene and what people are are into at that moment um, and then other places kind of like fall because they don't scratch that itch for people um, whatever you're, that itch is yeah you're a hundred percent correct that I mean and that's what I meant by it's a cyclical it, you know there's fads that are cyclical um, you know, right now, like I said, the tree removal is is popular. Connecting fairways is popular. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Or so, green cities. I've noticed you've done, I've done a lot of that, of that, which I think is lovely. Yeah, I love absolutely. I love visually and the playability of those two, George Wright, and uh, in particular, just some awesome little tie-ins there between those spaces that people love. Yep. And then, and at some point, they don't love them anymore. <laughs> for whatever reason right no it's that can be the case exactly yeah they'll, yeah they'll fall away when too many people do the same thing mm. and um you know and others like this lacy edged bunker style you know where it's constantly moving and you know really intricate edges and stuff like that i mean i think that's a that's a bit of a fad um no one did it and now all, all of a sudden all architects are doing it yeah so you know that'll fall away i'm sure it will do you find, I know you've done a few, like, where do you stand on like sh shorter rounds of golf, nine holes, little six hole golf courses. I used to, like that does it, that feels less of a fad and, and kind of a really nice way of, of getting people into the game in a new way. That's like this little stepping stone from maybe top golf and X golf and five iron and all of those kinds of places. And I know you've, I think you've done a few nine holers obviously. And then I think I saw a six hole golf course that you did, mm -hmm. um, at Wellesley, yep. the carriage course. Yep. yep. Um, I think that's just another, I, I, that's more than a fad, but I just another kind of architectural thing where it's, you might have a little bit of extra space you can, you can use to do something like that or uh, get kids more easily into the game. I think a lot of people, a lot of people forget, that even the guys who were playing yesterday in the U S open, like they start playing on short mm -hmm. nine hole golf courses right. um, where that's where they learn how to play the game. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think that um, I don't think it's necessarily a fad, but it is something that's popular. What's the fad to me is naming them and having like the, you know, everyone has to have a, a, a fancy little cute name to it. Um, but uh, that said, <laughs> We, you know, we were in a period in the, in the late 
you know, 2010s or to 2020, we were really losing a lot of golf courses, right? They were yeah. more closing than being built. And the ones that were being lost, a lot of times were exactly the ones you're talking about, the entry level golf courses. And so I feel like some of this, um, this building of some six hole and 12 holes and nine hole courses is, is a response to the fact that we were losing golf courses. And now we need places for these people to start on. If those yeah. are the courses we're losing, you, you know, it's really hard to start playing golf on some of these full 18 municipal golf courses that are doing, you know, 250 rounds a day. You, where do you put them? You know, they're going to feel like in, very intimidated out there trying to trying to learn the game. So, so it is imperative that we still have the short courses and it's hard to make money on a standalone six hole golf course. You, you're not going to be able yeah. to do it. So to have it be a part of a private club or part of another golf course is really what makes sense. And so I think that is a, a great way to um, continue to grow the game and get new people out in the game where they're not feeling intimidated. So so yeah, I was involved in the six hole par three course at a uh, Wellesley country club, which we, you know, we designed it as a kid's course and it's become a lot more than that. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's quite honestly, the seniors love it as much as the kids love it. Um, and, uh, another course that's had, it's been really, really popular is called the apple nine. It's at Lyman orchards golf club in, in, uh, Connecticut. Okay. Middlefield, Connecticut. It's uh, they have 36 holes of championship golf there. They have the Jones course and the player course. And uh, we added a nine hole uh, course, uh, very similar, you know, a little longer than Berlin country club. I mean, a little shorter than Berlin country club. It has two par fours and seven par threes. And uh, I talked to Tony Piopi about it all the time. And he's, you know, he's a golf writer. He lives in that area. And he said, the place is slammed. It's always got players there. It's also on that site. We built a nice uh, driving range and a, mm -hmm. a big putting green. And so it really draws the beginner player and the, and, you know, and the less skilled player. Um, it's been, been, been great for them. And yeah. they were very, very concerned about building it. Um, they had actually had the course permitted for 10 years and uh, we brought it back to life and said, you know, this is something we, I, we think you really should build. We just need to value engineer it and get the cost down, uh, which I did do that. And uh, yeah, it's been, been really good. Yeah. I was shocked to hear uh, that Massachusetts hasn't had an 18 hole golf course, a new one open in a decade. Right. The international is opening the opening their yes. kind of pines. I don't know what what word we use for it. Reimagined. Like it's a reimagined. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, I was just surprised that like, so we truthfully won't have like a new 18. It, it's a new 18 hole golf course, but it's on a piece of land that was already 18 holes. Correct. Um, it's, it is amazing that there hasn't been a new golf course built on a new piece of land um, in this state. And right. I've seen golf courses close uh ones that have i've played and have closed since i've played them but i don't i don't know is that well, just this one in acton that i did that quail, you said you grew up right quail ridge yeah my yeah, yeah my mom lives I mean, on that little that was gosh, like got one a of ghost the last, bunker in her backyard yeah that was one of the last 18s to be done in massachusetts yeah. and it didn't last very long and it was turned into nine holes so yeah yeah that's i i didn't even put that together that that was built in like oh six oh seven and then no way happened. And that was, yeah, it was just the timing. Timing was bad for them. Yes. Yeah. But that place is packed now. Every time I go visit my mom, there's always people out there playing Great. golf. And it's funny walking around. I see old vestiges of tea boxes in people's backyards and ghost bunkers and <laughs> little trails that you can see from green cities that, uh, it's a, it's actually a pretty good little nine holer. Um, good. I need to for, go back out there area. and see it then. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, that, this was great. You you said you had about a, a little over an hour. I, I really appreciate you giving your time and people should go play Mark Mungem golf courses. If you haven't, I'm sure you have blissful meadows, shaker Hills, Butterbrook, butternut farm, just a, a wealth of places around the area as that I've, that I've already played and, and love. And, um, and a lot of pe other people love, I blissful meadows is when I played and I thought, 
I like this place, but I'm not sure other people do. And every people <laughs> like love that place. Um, yeah. the part of the state it's in and anyways, so I just thank you for all of your work and, and your time today. And, uh, we'll have to have you back on again at some point, if there's anything else you want to chat about, I'm sure we left a lot on the bone here. Uh, yeah, I think thanks. we have. I yeah. think there's some things that we didn't get to, so that'll be fun. Yeah. 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 We can, we can do our own ranking. We can have a Munjum Melia uh, top 25 in Massachusetts. Awesome. I'm all <laughs> for it. I'm a little biased though, Sean, you know, yeah, that's true. The right that's true. The top. That's true. <laughs> uh, great. Well, thank you very much for your time and, uh, and we'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Sean. You take care.